Welcome. I'm Jeff Gedman. I'm president and CEO of the Lagakum Institute. Welcome Anne Applebaum. Anne is director of global transitions at the Lagakum Institute. She is also the very um, uh, well-cited and uh, actually world famous by this point. Uh, historian, journalist, you've won a Pulitzer Prize, Anne, but you've also won a new prize I'm going to ask you about in just a moment. Here's the book. It's Iron Curtain. It is uh, The Crushing of Eastern Europe, 1944 uh, to 1956, and you're just back from Canada. What were you doing in Canada? Right, well, I was in Canada because I was awarded the Cundill Prize for Historical Literature, which Good. is a book, which is a wonderful Canadian prize for, as far as I understand it, it's for history that makes an impact. In other words, it's for history that has some literary or, or social or political implications. So it was, it, was, it was a wonderful prize to win. Well, congratulations. We're Thank happy you. to have you back here in London at the Legatum Institute. My first question is, the crushing of Eastern Europe, uh, you uh, describe it in your book in great detail. What was happening? What was the Soviet Union doing? What was, uh, what was involved in this crushing of governments, politicians, civil societies? The, the, the book describes really what happened when the Red Army crossed the borders into Poland, uh, Eastern Germany, and Hungary, right as the war ended in 44 and 45. And it then talks about what, you know, my, I started with the question of how did all these really very different countries, how did they all become so similar within such a brief period of time? You know, if you'd walked around the capitals, you know, Warsaw, Prague, Budapest in 1950, it would look to you like they all had the same political system and the same party structure, the one party state, the same newspapers, the same everything. So what was done in that brief period of time to totalitarianize these societies? And the book goes through institution by institution. It looks at what was done to the press. It was looked at how the secret police was created. Um, it looks at the different methods that the, the Russians used, the Soviets, I should say, used when they arrived in these countries. Um, and it winds up, I wound up focusing on three areas. One was the secret police and the use of the secret police against a very targeted group of potential enemies, you know, the society's leaders. Um, another was the radio, how media was transformed very consciously into a tool of communist propaganda. Um, and then a third was um, the, the, the destruction of what we now call civil society. So in other words, groups, associations, youth movements, Boy Scouts, all kinds of institutions that exist in the society. And the, the, the repression of these actually took place before the nationalization of industry and before the destruction of the free market. So these were actually the things that the Russians considered, the Soviets considered most important, was to eliminate any kind of social institution, any source of alternative ideas or thought. So this was all part of a very explicit integrated strategy. It was an explicit integrated strategy. It wasn't exactly a strategy, a day-by-day -day strategy. Stalin was an opportunist and he took opportunities when he had them and he probably wasn't sure he would be able to take over Hungary, for example, but then he, you know, he managed to do it. But it was certainly the main, sort of the main prongs of what they did had been established before they arrived. Was this, what was the motive? What was the thinking? What was the grander strategy of the Soviet Union? Was this simply power and domination? Or was there genuinely the idea that we're constructing something new? Part I, think of a they, I, think they, I think they believed it was a global movement, and I think they believed they were constructing something new. I mean, I'm, the people always say, did they, would, did they really believe in their ideas as if that would somehow make it better? I mean, I, um, I think, yes, they did believe in their ideas, and, they, and their idea was you know, the total domination of Soviet style communist parties who are totally loyal to Moscow. Um, and they believed that this was, this, you know, they interpreted, this is how they interpreted Marx and Lenin. You know, this was their, you know, this wasn't just a theory, this was a science. You know, so many, many, much of what you see in this period is them turning to the original texts and saying, here's how this is supposed to happen, here's what we do. Um, and then they become frustrated, of course, when it doesn't always work the way it's supposed to work, and then they look for, for, for explanations. But no, I think, they, I, think it was, I think it was simultaneously about power, and it was about ideas. You know, they weren't, those things weren't different to Stalin. You know, the, the domination of Central Europe was part of the, 
um, eventual communist domination of the world. This was just step one, and step two was going to be France and Italy. What about the relevance today? Why did you pick this period? And is there anything that this book can tell us about struggles today, ideology today, technology today? Well, funny enough, one of the inspirations for the book was some of the things happening in the present. You know, I've spent a lot of the last two decades, really, so it's living in, mostly in Poland, but elsewhere, and traveling a lot in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, watching people put the pieces back together again. You know, how do you reconstruct democracy? How do you reconstruct capitalism? You know, what are the missing bits that have to go back in? And, um, th you know, that's now a question that's, of course, just as pertinent in North Africa and in the Arab world and parts of Africa. You know, how do you recreate societies that have been destroyed by um, either a Soviet style or an authoritarian, authoritarian, another kind of authoritarian style dictatorship? Um, and I think in order to understand how you do the reconstruction, how you spread democracy or spread capitalism, you need to understand how it was destroyed in the first place and what was the thinking of the people who did the destruction. And so for me, this book is sort of background reading for understanding the 90s and understanding today's Russia and understanding Libya. You know, what is, what's missing in Libya? You know, what, are the, what did Gaddafi take out of the society? What has to go back? Um, and this, this, this story is not dissimilar to the story of what, what took place you know, in the Arab world in the 50s and 60s and 70s, too. I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's the opposite. You know, we now talk a lot about putting societies back together. Well, this is the story of how you take them apart. And so I feel like it's the, it's the background to, to much of what happens today. And thank you. Welcome thank back you. from Canada, <laughs> and congratulations on winning this prestigious McGill University Kundal Prize. Thank you very much. Good to have you. <laughs> thank you.